Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kim Matheson. I'm the manager of Career Services and your host for the morning. On behalf of Dr. Nancy Turner, Dr. Wendy James, and the teams at Career Services and the Gwendamaw Center for Teaching and Learning, welcome. It's very nice to have you here today to share this space with you um, and to gather here on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. As we enjoy our time together, we pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we look forward to sharing space, food, and conversation with you today as we create new connections and reaffirm our relationships with one another. This is our first faculty experiential learning symposium, and as Nancy and Wendy and I began to uh, think about today and exploring what it might look like, our vision was to create an opportunity to bring together and grow a community at the University of Saskatchewan that values, supports, and invests in experiential learning. With the folks here today, we can see that that community exists and is eager to come together and learn from each other. Some of you may know Career Services by its former name, and that is the Student Employment and Career Centre, or the SECC. Um, along with our name change to Career Services, our vision and mandate has evolved as well. And we are really excited to share expertise and work alongside our talented colleagues at the Gwena Moss Centre for Teaching and Learning to support the experiential learning framework, which Nancy uh, and Kathleen are going to speak to today, to contribute to this community and the important work, and ultimately to empower our students to become what the world needs. Two quick housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, so we will stay in this room for the first portion of the morning. Uh, we'll take a quick break at 10 and move to our breakout sessions. And then we'll come back here for a wrap up and then move to lunch. Secondly, our colleagues from Media Productions will be filming us for the first portion of the morning until the break. And this recording will be available to you in the coming weeks. Thank you again for joining us, and I would like to now welcome President Peter Soichev to the podium to offer his greetings and opening remarks. Thank you very much, Kim, and welcome everybody. It's really great to be here. It's a privilege to be here to say a few words to you. Thanks to Nancy Turner and to Kathleen James Cavan and uh, to the Gwenamos staff as well and all of those who have been responsible for putting this wonderful event together. Um, I'm not here to convince you of the importance of experiential learning. Um, I'm here to lend my support uh, to this really important work that you're doing and to say a few reasons why I think it's really important for the university, for students, for the region that we live in, um, for the country that we live in, and for our times. Uh, we talk about the fact as you were just mentioning, Kim, that we're the university the world needs. And <clears throat> a lot of people have at times misinterpreted that as a boast. You know, we're so important and so wonderful. The vastness of our greatness is wonderful to behold. And, and we are definitely needed by the world as a result. But it's, it's not that at all. It's a commitment to service. And it's a challenge to ourselves to be better all the time and to be wherever it's possible for a university to be as relevant as we can be all the time. It's a commitment to being outward facing. And that might sound like a truism in many sectors. <clears throat> it hasn't always been a truism with universities. And with this one, I think actually right from the beginning of our history, uh, it has been. This has been a university of service, um, understanding the role that it plays in the province it's named after, understanding its role in a vibrant city, and so on. And if we're going to be willing to serve, if we're going to be an outward-facing university, understanding our purpose, the form that I believe that can take, and I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't disagree, the form that I believe that can take in teaching is in experiential learning. So I think it's really, really important. Um, students want the opportunities, employers want the talent, and governments, particularly our federal government, has been supportive of experiential learning in several recent budgets. Not the most recent, <laughs> but budgets before that. 
they've been very deliberate and they've been very intentional about their support for experiential learning. And that gives us a great opportunity to move uh, into that space as much as possible. I think I'm aware, probably not as deeply as you are, but still aware of the fact that if you look at the percentage of uh, experiential learning opportunities across this campus, that number has grown steeply over the last few years. And many of you in this room are probably responsible for that success. And I really, really thank you for that. And I'm sure that thousands of students thank you for that as well, and indeed employers. So I don't think you're here today to discuss how to increase that percentage, although that would always help. Um, but it's more to discuss what the value is, um, what the different forms of experiential learning can be, and to increase you know, the quality of it and the reach of it and our creative thinking around it. And I really applaud you for doing that because I think that's the necessary next step as well. Another thing that I just wanted to point out is that this university plays a larger role than is typical of universities, even the top universities in this country, and we're among that group as a U15, in terms of uh, the role that we play in the economy, the local economy, the regional economy, even the Canadian economy. And one of the forms that that takes with us is the role that we have to play in what I call the innovation ecosystem here and provincially and regionally and across the country. And I'll just throw out a couple of observations about that and then close. <clears throat> Saskatoon is the second fastest growing IT hub in this country. It has been for several years now. It's documented, it's measured. We're behind only Kitchener-Waterloo. We're not behind Vancouver, we're not behind Calgary, we're not behind Edmonton, we're not behind Toronto, we're not behind Halifax, we're not behind Montreal, we're not behind Quebec City, you name it. We're behind only Kitchener-Waterloo. Another region and city that has a tremendous U15 university. But Saskatoon is the second fastest growing IT hub in this country. It is the fastest growing location by far on the whole continent for venture capital investment. In other words, people who want to invest see a rich future in all senses of that term in Saskatoon and in the province, but particularly in Saskatoon. Four companies were listed in the Globe and Mail's fastest growing companies in Canada that are in Saskatoon, four of them. Regina, no disrespect, I'm just giving a sense of where we are with this, had one. Saskatoon had four. So the employment opportunities and the creative innovation sector that we have at our doorstep is extraordinary and actually unparalleled in the country. I'll add to that because I just saw this recently, that at the very top of the Globe and Mail's list of the best employers, in the country are Saskatoon companies. And one Saskatoon company is number one out of every single company in the whole country. These are not things to ignore when we think about the opportunities that we would like to give to our students. So our role in that innovation ecosystem is extremely important. Kitchener-Waterloo wouldn't be first and ahead of us if it didn't have a University of Waterloo. And Saskatoon would not be second if it weren't for the fact that the University of Saskatchewan is right here in its midst. And I won't take your time to go through the many uh, ways in which we've been very deliberate about our relationship with the city of Saskatoon, but we have been. So I'm just saying that, you know, from the perspective of the opportunities that are on our doorstep for our thousands and thousands of students, they're many, they're varied, they're creative and we exist in a city that relies on our students and wants to see our students employed and having learning experiences within it. And I'll finish with this. Um, my background is in the humanities. I am a colleague of Kathleen James Cavins in the English department. I taught there for 20 some odd really wonderful years. And I've often reflected on 
the role that the humanities, the social sciences, the fine arts can play in a really uh, rich and productive innovation ecosystem. And it too is immense. When I think back over the pandemic, um, I think about the fact that science did its part, um, the Vito labs did their part, all of those working hard around the world to develop vaccines did their part. But what the world really needs now, along with that continually, back to the point that we are the university or want to be the university that the world needs, what the world really needs is the communication skills, the understanding of diversity, the recognition of political differences, all those things that the humanities, the social sciences, and the fine arts can bring to us. I just mentioned that to say that there's a huge role for experiential learning for students in those disciplines, which amount to many of our students around this university. The roles aren't restricted only to students in the STEM disciplines, although of course uh, those opportunities are there as well. We have many kinds of programming um, that uh, support experiential learning at the university, the RBC Learn to Work, Work to Learn program, the RIPEN program, the Future Skills Innovation Network, or Fusion as it's called. And these are testaments to a lot of different organizations understanding the capacity that we have and the opportunities that we have here for our students and wanting to leverage them and wanting to invest in them. So that's my little pitch for why, and it's just a beginning, but Nancy told me I couldn't go on for an hour, much as she was trying to be accommodating, for why the work that you're doing is really, really important. Universities are changing. Our post-pandemic shift project encourages us to think about change, to take risks, to not just look back and say, well, we want to return to the way we were before the pandemic. And the whole project, if I can call it that, of experiential learning at the University of Saskatchewan is a perfect opportunity to think in those ways. So I really thank you for the work that you have been doing, some of you for years, the work that you're going to be doing today and I just wanted to support you in saying that it's, it's so important that so many students will benefit enormously in ways that they won't even know um, from the hard work that you're doing and they won't even know that you did it, but it's, it's such important work. So thank you, Kathleen, thanks Nancy, thanks Kim, thanks everybody and have a really enriching day. Thank you, President Stoichev, for lending your, your, um, your thoughts today and sharing your support with us. I would now like to invite Dr. Nancy Turner, Director, Teaching and Learning Enhancement, and Dr. Kathleen James Cavan, Chair, Teaching, Learning and Academic Resources Committee of University Council, and Associate Professor, Department of English, to share some history and context for experiential learning at USASC and our new um, proposed experiential learning framework. Fantastic. Well, it's so wonderful to be here with all of you today. I have to say I was walking across campus and just so excited about being physically in a room with a group of people um, talking about teaching and learning. I, I certainly have valued all of the opportunities to do so virtually over the last couple of years, but this is just fantastic to see so many familiar faces and some new ones as well. Um, and and uh, the demand that we, an interest we had um, in this session was really also quite overwhelming. In fact, we um, had the spaces fill up within days of this opening up for registration. So um, to um, President Stoichev's point, there's a lot of interest, a lot of demand, a lot of people across the campus who are, um, and, and, and our campuses who are committed to this work and see the value and importance of it. So for those who I have not had an opportunity to meet yet, my name's Nancy Turner. As Kim said, I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning Enhancement here at the University of Saskatchewan. My role connects with experiential learning in a few different ways. Firstly, I have the great privilege of working with colleagues in the Gwena Moss Centre and in Career Services, two units that support experiential learning on campus, um, and have the, the uh, great honour of working with Wendy and Kim particularly um, in that and, and colleagues in those units. 
I also have the great privilege of serving the Teaching, Learning, and Academic Resources Committee of Council, or TLARC. Um, you'll hear that acronym a few times today because a lot of what you're going to hear today about the framework and the development came out of TLARC's good work. And I um, have the honor of serving that committee and helping to support the, the work of um, faculty colleagues and leaders who are um, kind of charging ahead in terms of thinking about teaching and learning innovation in our, in our direction. So I have that great honor of connecting and serving TLARC as well. And I'm pleased to be here to talk about some of that work um, today as well. So Kathleen, I'll invite you to introduce yourself. I'm Kathleen James Cavan, and I am a member of the English department. Um, I've been there for 30 years, and uh, I have the privilege of chairing TLARC, the Teaching, Learning, and Academic Resource Committee of Council this year, and uh, working on one of the, uh, the working groups is devoted to experiential learning. Um, and I have been involved in experiential learning for probably the last 15 or more years teaching in the Department of English, which I'll talk about a bit later, and really enjoying my time working with Nancy on this particular project. Thank you. Great. So Kathleen and I are gonna go back and forth a little bit um, as, we, as we go. And I think, I have not tested the clicker, but I'm hoping that it's working all right. So what we would like to do today is take you through this process. This is just the, the next kind of 40 minutes or so we're going to be um, going through these points. So talking a little bit about the history of experiential learning at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, Peter gave us some good insights in terms of the, the origin even of the university and its basis in service to community. Um, and we've really, um, in the last kind of decade, um, solidified that and um, clearly um, had experiential learning as a priority for uh, the institution. So we'll talk a little bit about that to kind of ground this in that context. We then want to talk about how we're defining experiential learning, some of the work of the Teaching, Learning, and Academic Resources Committee of Council, that's the last time I'll say it, TLERC, um, uh, to help um, clarify our definition of experiential learning and work that's been going on in the last couple of years, talk about the outcomes of experiential learning. Um, Peter spoke to many of them, but really, why are we doing this? Why is this important for us as an institution? Why are we investing time, resources, why, um, you know, um, instructor and faculty and academic leader energy in experiential learning? And then talk a bit about the draft framework. And really, we are at the point of that being a draft, and we're here to get your input and feedback and response to it as part of our uh, discussion today. So that's what we're gonna go through. It will be punctuated, um, as you might expect, by you discussing and thinking about experiential learning as well. So we're gonna have a couple of opportunities for that. You might have noticed some brown envelopes sitting on tables and those will come into play uh, a little bit later. Um, and I'll, we'll check and make sure that everybody's got one at, on their table as we go. So just to start with that bit of history, so it was a decade ago that um, the University of Saskatchewan brought experiential learning quite explicitly into its kind of strategic plans by having that um, experiential learning targets and goals integrated into our third integrated plan, which is kind of the precursor of what we now call our university plan. So it was pulled in, we had clear targets identified, um, and uh, this was really designated as a priority area and was invested in institutionally. That was followed on the heels of TLARC, um, picking up that kind of prioritization of experiential learning, um, writing a concept paper that was uh, released and identifying five priority areas for experiential learning at that time. And this was really important to kind of say, uh, they, they did a benchmarking project at that time saying this is where we are with experiential learning, the kinds of opportunities that we have. And it helped kind of set those, that trajectory and those goals for growth over a five year period of time. So that's really what the foundation was to lead to that year on year growth and experiential learning that Peter um, mentioned. 
This is a graph that we've actually taken from part of um, our performance framework that we report to the government annually. Um, it's just been formalized. We've always reported annually to um, the government of Saskatchewan on experiential learning. It's a great of great interest to them. Um, this is uh, now a formalized part of a performance framework and we have reported um, just recently to government on some of these um, these numbers in terms of the trajectory of growth of experiential learning at USASC. So this is the percentage of undergraduates who have had an experiential learning opportunity by the time they graduate at the University of Saskatchewan. So you can see that we have seen that growth over time from 2012 to 2020-21. Um, I think our numbers show that about 50% of students have at least one experience every year. So again, that just gives you a little bit of a different way to um, look at the data. So if we go back to the timeline, um, in 2019, really it was seven years from that kind of initial um, framing of experiential learning as a priority, um, we realized that experiential learning had evolved. There was more research, there was a lot more activity in the sector. We were recognizing the need and the call to prepare students to contribute to an increasingly complex world. Um, and TLARC really took up that call and uh, determined that it was time to return to looking at the um, experiential learning work that had been done back in 2012 and 2013. We were also in that time period from 2013 to 2019 getting some uh, feedback from the university community that the definition of experiential learning that we had was not completely clear. There was a lot of kind of gray, fuzzy areas um, around what was and what wasn't experiential learning, what counted, what was tracked. We also heard that kind of those five priority areas that had been identified, um, as well as our definition and our tracking process, were excluding some really important types of experiential learning that we weren't actually capturing all that was happening across campus. And that meant that we weren't tracking it, we weren't reporting it, we also weren't allocating resource or support to it, and we weren't able to identify it and point students to those opportunities um, in, in the way that we want to. And we also heard that those opportunities that we were missing in our tracking were the ones that were particularly um, accessible to students. So things that were happening on our campus, that um, on our campuses that students would be able to access. And so uh, we definitely wanted to look at that as a TLARC committee. So in 2019, we formed that working group that Kathleen mentioned, um, which is kind of the way that TLARC works. And we started looking at um, opportunities to update the definition, get some clarity there, and also to create a more inclusive framework, something that was going to acknowledge some of these things that had been, um, we were hearing had been excluded um, before. So in doing that work, we set out to identify experiential learning, to know uh, when it was needed and valuable. Having a clear definition really helps us to know what kind of outcomes we achieve through it and know where in an academic program, for example, it can be most important for students to have those experiential learning opportunities. It can also help us to determine how effective we're being at um, achieving those outcomes that experiential learning brings. It makes tracking and reporting uh, far easier and more comprehensive um, and, and ensuring that we are not missing anything helps us to address some of those excluded types of experiential learning that we were hearing about from the community. And also we wanted to explicitly recognize the value of indigenization and internationalization as part of experiential learning. And so that was something we set out to do as a working group as well. So here we are in 2022. We have a, a proposed framework, proposed definition to share with you. We've had some feedback from the university community and we're really pleased to be here to get your feedback and input as well. Um, we, um, I think, um, recognize that this has taken us a little bit of time from 2019 to 2022. Um, of course, you'll notice that there was a pandemic <laughs> in the middle of that, delayed our work a little bit, um, makes us even more pleased to be here today to be sharing this work. So before we get into what TLARC's come up with, we want you to warm up your thinking by considering what experiential learning means to you at this point. So, this is where those brown envelopes come into play. So at your table, everybody should have a brown envelope. Any table not have one? A few at the back, okay. Kathleen will bring some. 
And if you're at a table by yourself, can you just turn and try to work with at least one other person, if that's possible? And on, you can open your envelopes now. Inside you have 14 little cards that have descriptions of learning experiences on them. We want you to categorize those into is experiential learning, is not experiential learning, or you are unsure. So three categories, 14 cards, talk at your table, and if you can just leave them set out as you um, kind of agree on the categorization at the end, that would be great. We're going to give you five minutes to do this activity. Where you go. Okay, I'm going to bring everybody back together. Now, we could probably have a, a long, very rich discussion. I also saw some people had the one-page handout that they were referring to, so that's excellent. <laughs> Use of resources at hand. Fantastic. Okay, just leave your cards out if you can, if it's not too disruptive to um, having, having them out in front of you. We are going to return to those cards um, nearer the end. So I mentioned at the outset when I was giving kind of a bit of that context and that history that um, there was some concern around the clarity of the definition of experiential learning that we were using. So what has TLARC kind of been devising? Obviously drawing strongly from the literature and expertise. Um, how are we defining experiential learning? What have we come up with? And again, the one page handout that you have gives you some, some insights into that. I wanted to start, before we dive into talking about experiential learning, I wanted to talk about um, active learning and how we define active learning. And the reason I want to do that is because we often get active learning and experiential learning kind of muddled, which is quite easy to do, very similar. And so di differentiating them, I think, can be a helpful way to think about um, defining experiential learning. So we're going to begin with the premise that students gain knowledge or come to know through their learning experiences with us as part, of their, um, as part of their academic program. When we have students do something with that knowledge, apply it, students are doing an activity. So we have students active and engaged in a process. So students taking their knowledge and applying it um, is an activity. It's, this is really helpful. We know we do this in our classrooms quite frequently. We get students to engage, we get them to, um, to think, and that is uh, incredibly helpful. We make it an intentional learning experience when we add feedback and reflection. That's what turns it from students doing an activity to students being engaged in active learning. And that feedback and reflection is really crucial. And again, I see heads nodding. I know this group will be very aware of this. Um, that feedback is where we let students know how their application of that knowledge, um, how they did in that, um, what they um, got right, what they could do differently, how they could adjust. And we can give them that feedback in a lot of different ways. It doesn't necessarily mean it's we're giving them written feedback. They could talk to a peer. We could show them what good looks like. They could discuss it. Um, and we could, we could give them um, a correct answer if it's something that's more of a, of a formula problem. And then we give them that opportunity to take that feedback and think about what they would do the same or different next time in that application of knowledge, that reflective piece. And that's what gets us to active learning. So how is experiential learning different than this? In experiential learning, we add context where the context is actually a really important component of the learning and the outcomes that we want students to achieve. So it's that essential component. The application occurs in that context. So just as with, um, and that's what experiential learning is, just as with active learning, if we take away the reflection and feedback, we have students doing an experience. Again, can be valuable, um, but it's that feedback and reflection that really gets us to um, that experiential learning. So that really critical piece. It turns it from something that is just students doing an experience to uh, students having that intentional learning opportunity. In this, we've got really four essential elements of experiential learning, and you'll see those defined on your one-page handout. Um, that feedback and reflection, which I've talked about, and that doing our application in context. 
I wanted to just talk a little bit more specifically about that doing in context because the way we define those is important again in helping us determine what is and isn't experiential learning. So to be experiential, there we go. To be experiential learning for that doing in context, we want students to apply their knowledge by actually doing an activity. That we want that to be um, creating a situation where there are unpredictable factors, where students have to make decisions in that application and kind of navigate some, some level of complexity. And that application should happen in an authentic context um, where students make decisions and they are actually trying to determine what the best path forward is as they go um, throughout, the, throughout the process of applying their knowledge. So that authentic context could be because they've got an authentic problem that they're dealing with. It could be that they have a real client that they're working with that gives it that um, authenticity. It could be that they have an audience beyond the class that they're sharing outcomes to. In some way we are making that more complex, having students make decisions and, um, and navigate that unpredictability um, in the application in context. So let's just work through an example. There we go. So, we often talk about uh, labs in experiential learning. When is a lab experiential learning and when might it not be? So it's a, it's a question we often get asked. So, so I have chosen this example. So in a first year lab, we have students um, learn the steps of a process to get to a correct result. We um, have students actually using lab equipment to actually gain those kind of technical skills that they, they need as they go. They might get feedback um, throughout the process if they have a question on something that didn't quite go right. Or the lab instructor kind of comes by and gives them some uh, guidance on what they're doing. And they might get a mark on a lab report at the end. This wouldn't be experiential learning, and that's mostly because of that unpredictability. They're following steps, they're not having to make decisions or limited decision making, and so it's more formulaic in terms of what the students are doing. Really important active learning. They are gaining really essential skills, but it's not flipping into that experiential learning um, form. We have an upper year lab where a student is actually designing a process for investigation and data analysis. They're actually narrowing and defining a problem. They're um, maybe developing a, an hypothesis. They're actually um, creating and using a process to get to um, test that hypothesis and then decide how to analyze the outcomes. Um, the student probably through that will be getting ongoing feedback on their decision making and their process as they go, um, both in terms of how things actually go and, and an instructor um, helping them throughout the process. So the lab and that complex problem make this experiential learning. That decision making that the student needs to do throughout um, and those opportunities for feedback and reflection. So that has all of those elements of experiential learning that we've talked about. So this is where we've landed in terms of our definition and you do have that with those kind of components um, defined on the handout that you have and you'll have a chance to kind of dive in and engage in that um, as we go. We wanted to, before we um, move on, also talk a little bit about why experiential learning matters. So taking that definition and thinking about why we are investing the time and resource. And again, don't want to belabor this because I know this group is very committed already. Um, the fact that you've given up some of your time to be here um, shows that. But I think it's helpful to just frame it as we're talking to colleagues and as we're thinking about why we're investing our own time and energy in this to think about um, why we are why we are doing so. Ultimately, experiential learning helps us support students to achieve uh, the types of goals that we have set out for them. Um, the capacity to use the knowledge that they've gained in ways that matter during their study, but also after graduation. That's really fundamentally what experiential learning helps us to get to. So they can think critically, they can help solve problems. Without that, we can have a gap between what students know and what we want them to be able to do. We can end up with a gap in, in between those two things. So let's start by just considering what our ideal circumstance is in terms of a setup of a learning experience. If my clicker works, there we go. I'm just like, waiting for it to go like three times. So we start with um, an outcome. 
So what we want the student to learn to do during the course, that, that thing that we've defined that this learning experience will help them do. On the other side of that, we've got the assessment, the evidence that will accept that they've actually achieved that outcome. Okay, so this is kind of a nicely kind of lined up um, learning opportunity. And fundamentally, in a perfect ex experience, learning experience, the instruction, what we do to help facilitate students in learning, is what will bridge that gap between that outcome and them producing that evidence that they've achieved the outcome. So that's what helps us get from the outcome to that um, assessment. And ideally, again, those learning experiences, if we want to get them to being able to do something, include students being able to actually practice, to get feedback, to reflect on their experience, and that helps them move across that bridge towards um, being able to produce that evidence. And that's called constructive alignment. Again, I know this is a concept known by, by some in the room, might be new to others. So what happens when we don't have that? So we're gonna, we're gonna just dive into a, a little bit more of a specific example. So if we have um, an outcome set for somebody where we actually want them to design a working prototype that is responding to a particular problem that's been set for a group of students. And our assessment is that we want them to share that prototype with a panel of experts. So we've got outcomes and assessments set up here that are really quite well um, aligned with what we might expect in experiential learning. But inadvertently, we just tell students about the, de the design process. We give them definitions of the parts of the design process rather than having them actually do that application, get that feedback and reflect on it and kind of make their way across. So we've got a gap here between what we've done in the instruction and what we, where we want to get them to. And this is the knowing doing gap. This is coming directly from Dr. James. <laughs> the knowing doing gap where we're not going to get students across that bridge. We're not gonna get them to achievement of outcomes because our instruction hasn't given them that bridge, hasn't allowed them to get to that point. So it's less likely in this example that most students will learn what we intend them to learn. Some will because they'll find, out a, they'll find a way to do it themselves, but we haven't intentionally designed our learning experience for that to happen. So that's really imp an important component of experiential learning. It helps us build that bridge. It helps us have students achieve those outcomes that we intend them to. They can learn how to apply their knowledge um, in real situations, um, in those contexts that we've, that we've got that are set up as authentic. Um, and it allows students to actually tackle those real authentic problems with real organizations sometimes. Um, and it also can help students see the purpose in their course. If they can see that the outcome is something that um, they are going to be able to use after graduation, it helps them also see relevance and connect to um, their learning experience. And ultimately, we've set in our university plan a goal, an ambition, to have distinguished learners um, who can address the greatest challenges and opportunities. Our graduates can address the greatest challenges and opportunities the world faces. And that certainly requires application of knowledge um, in complex ways. So we're gonna now go to Kathleen, who's going to share a little bit of why experiential learning kind of has mattered to her and her experiences of um, leading experiential learning. Okay. So my class, English 496, or career internship, is designed to give students an experience in a real authentic context. And they work for a term in a, a position as diverse as um, an NGO or um, an arts organization, or they work here on campus in the communications departments, um, and they they produce work and material, but along the way, what happens is that students find out that they really can write 
I know that seems strange for English students, but when you have students who are prepared to write essays for four years of their lives, and then they need to translate that capacity into a real life context, it, there's a gap. There's that learning doing gap. My course, my course, the course that is offered by my department, and I've had the privilege of teaching for the last few years, is an opportunity to bridge that gap. Um, and what I experience in the teaching, which is so ex exciting, is that transformation from a student who can frame a really wonderful essay, but doesn't really understand how to make their ideas clear to the average person. They, by about February, because we offer it in, this, in term two every year, by about February, just before reading break, light bulbs tend to go on and students say, I really can affect the world by my writing, by the newsletters that they write or the grants that they learn to write for their NGOs. They, they, get, they engage in real authentic writing situations. So I wanted to give you an example of, now um, th you won't be able to read the, uh, the material here. The students spend um, the vast majority of the course time actually in their authentic workplace. The student who produced this poster was working with um, the Saskatchewan Lear Literacy Network and worked on clear language. And uh, one of the things I'd like to challenge my students with is at the end of their, their course, they produce a research essay, but they also produce, because you know English students think in words, they, I ask them to produce a poster with illustrations of their research paper that they produce at the end. Um, this student worked on clear language and, and his paper was all about why clear language has benefits uh, to all sectors, including financial benefits to, to businesses. And for him, it was quite a journey from learning how to write the essay to now learning how to write sentences in 25 words or fewer, and using language that is not Latinate, uh, is clear, and, and, and his paper showed that learning and that transformation. Um, another student was working with an arts organization, Paved Arts, and she, uh, she was very interested in the topic of decolonization as they were as well. So during her internship, she was producing archived material, helping them to, um, to write documents and for, for the public. And also, at the same time, she was working, uh, learning from the uh, executive director and the board about their interest in, in decolonization for that particular arts organization. It's an arts it's an artist-run organization based here in, in Saskatoon, and it's part of a network of artist-run organizations. And uh, so she began to research how other arts organizations across Canada were dealing with this topic. That report, as all the students' reports, um, then are shared with their, um, their supervisor, the organization that they're working for. And this has produced, um, this is her poster illustrating her learning, but it also, her paper becomes part, something, uh, part of what the organization benefits from. They benefit from her engagement in the, with the, the community in the writing that she does, and they also uh, benefit from the research. So what I see happening is a very exciting um, movement from the theory of how to write to students being able to write and, and write in a condition and an authentic place where, where their words matter. Their words matter to a, a, large, a large group of people. Not all students get this opportunity, but the, the, one of the other benefits too is that students can also name what they know. I think employers find that students, especially when, they're, when they first graduated and they're applying for their first jobs, they have trouble saying what they know how to do. The students who have gone through an experiential learning ex pro uh, process, because they've been reflecting all the way along, are able to say, I know how to do this. I know how to write a grant because 
I have done that. I know how to do something beyond, I know how to write an essay. Uh, and so um, I think that, that for me, the reflection part of experiential learning is key. It, if you don't reflect on the experience, you can't say what you know. And that's the purpose of these kinds of uh, experiences for the students in my class anyway. Brilliant. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks for sharing that um, experience. So now we're going to go back to the card sort. <laughs> so I want to give you about um, three to four minutes to just go back to your cards at your table and see if after this conversation and these examples, you would shift anything into a different category. So over to you. Just before we... Um, wrap up and, and um, hopefully have a couple of minutes for questions. I just wanted to go into um, that, that draft framework that we talked about, which includes the definition. And we've spent a lot of time talking about the definition because it's one of the most complex components of the overall framework. But I did want to talk just a bit about um, kind of a matrix that we've created to help to um, present the different types of experiential learning that happen on our campus, help us imagine what experiential could look like, experiential learning could look like, and help us kind of um, open up those opportunities um, for different types of experiential learning. We wanted to recognize that um, experiential learning can happen in different locations, and we kind of alluded a little bit to this at the beginning. Um, so there are different locations where experiential learning can occur. As long as the experience that's, that's created, that's intentionally designed, meets that definition, experiential learning can, in fact, occur within the classroom. It can occur within a lab, within a performance space. It can also occur, of course, in a professional context or some other type of immersive context that's not on our campuses. Um, and all three of those are perfectly valid locations for experiential learning to, um, to occur. We recognize that as we move from kind of classroom-based experiential learning opportunities to that more immersive context that's kind of outside of the academic environment, the complexity of those opportunities, um, that context grows. And the richness and the depth of learning that students can get by having to navigate that complexity certainly is there. Um, they can learn from all facets of that more immersive experience. So we want to acknowledge that it can happen in all three of these areas. We want to um, acknowledge that experiential learning can be done in the classroom. It can be more accessible to a larger group of students if we actually design intentional experiential learning in the classroom. But we don't want, we want there, that to grow. We don't want that to take the place of those more immersive experiences that can happen outside of um, our campus environments. We also acknowledge that there are different types of experiential learning um, that occur in our context. And we've got some icons to represent these. So worker entrepreneurship focused, research focused, project or problem focused, community service or engagement focused, and then creative practice focused. So if we take those domains and we lay them on one side, and then we map that with those three different contexts, that we're in which experiential learning can occur, those locations in which experiential learning can occur, we create a matrix. And that means we can fill that matrix. You might be able to see this better on, the, on um, looking on the sides with different types of experiential learning that can happen, different contexts across those varying domains. Um, and that gives us kind of a, an opportunity to think quite broadly about the different types of experiential learning and the different ways in which we can create those intentional learning experiences for students. Again, in the classroom, a little bit more accessible to a larger group of students and then moving to that more immersive kind of context um, out in a professional or other type of context. And also, in addition to this, in alignment with our intention to have students um, be able to engage in an intercultural society, to be able to um, work on advancing inclusivity both in their learning but also after graduation, we have added, inter we've added some intentional amplifiers. And these amplifiers are intercultural or international in focus, as well as indigenous focused or indigenous led. These really can add 
a further richness and complexity to the, the domains that exist, the, the five domains that exist. So a student, for example, could um, work with an Indigenous community partner on a community-engaged project. And that could add that complexity and richness to that experience for that student. We could also see a student undertake a project with an intercultural lens, for example, in the um, problem or project focused strand. So again, adding that kind of complexity and richness. This does definitely require intentional planning, careful planning, so that we are in fact supporting students in having those um, intercultural and kind of inclusivity focused um, activities as part of their experiential learning. And that's something that we can talk about when we get into our breakout groups as well. So that's the overall framework. And I want to just open it up. I think we've got just a few minutes for any questions or comments if anybody wanted to either reflect on your card sorting or have any um, reflections on that definition or the framework as it's been presented today. Hi, um, my question is about the graph you showed early on about the increasing level of um, experiential learning opportunities. And I'm wondering what those actually track. Like, was that tracking the breadth of experience that you just listed? Because I think those are maybe harder to ferret out. So I'm wondering what that graph um, represents. Yeah, great question, Candice. Um, that graph is capturing some of what we've got to find here in the framework. So over the last couple of years, we have expanded and ensured that we were looking at things like um, performance focus, our creative arts, and getting a little bit more inclusive in that way in our counting. Um, but it doesn't include everything. And I agree with you, they're going to be more challenging for us to track and report on. Um, and that's going to be an important next step once we have this defined is how are we going to go about doing that? How are we going to ensure that we know where this is happening? mostly for the purposes of providing support resources and allowing students to identify where those opportunities exist so they can seek them out, but also so that we can in fact track and report um, because this matters to external agencies. So yeah, great question. Yeah. Back. Is there a difference between just practice and experiential learning? <laughs> yeah, I think that I would, um, to me, the, the difference is when you get into that feedback and reflection. So, and also where exactly you practice. So you could practice in a context where you're not having to do as much decision making. There isn't as much complexity that you're navigating. As Soon as you move into practicing in that more authentic context, and then you get feedback and reflection, that's when you get into the realm of experiential learning. Does that help? Yeah. So. Practicing and coaching, like on a sports team, is that experiential learning? Yeah, if as part of that process, the student is actually being guided where they're practicing and then they try something and then they get feedback on, on that application and then they are deliberately thinking about that and um, planning for their next attempt, absolutely. Yeah, please. As I was doing um, consulting on the initial draft of the framework, this is the most common question. Like where would the line be between practice and, and EL. Mm -hmm. And one of the distinctions that might be helpful here too is around the complexity of the decision making that the student is doing. So when the when the context, when you're breaking it down so you're just working on a very tiny piece of something, um, chunk it down to a very isolated skill and you're rehearsing that skill basically, mm -hmm. that would probably not be EL, although you are practicing. But when you're at the stage where more of those are consolidated to the point where you actually have to make a call, this, not this, because of these five things I'm observing as this happens, then you might be in the EL zone. And that is on a continuum, absolutely. And part of the complexity is going to be where are we on this continuum. But the value of EL is not so much in these small chunks that might be active, but really in the places where that context is really shaping calls that you're making. Because that's where we're really confident that it's getting over that knowing doing gap. When you can put those pieces together and make a connection call. I don't know if that's actually yep. helpful, Nancy, but. No, that is, that's really helpful, thank you. But and it is great. About that, because I've had that question a lot. Yeah, that's great. Great clarification, Jerry. <laughs> I just wondered what experience or ideas you had of mapping this onto curriculum review. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. <laughs> uh, you know, really, um, 
ideally, when we think about experiential learning, we think about it as where should this happen in a program of study? To Wendy's good point, at what point have students kind of mastered some of those smaller chunks and we're ready to give them that more complex experience to help kind of boost their learning um, throughout an academic program? So thinking about it programmatically, thinking about where we're intentionally embedding it in an academic program is absolutely where we get the most value. Um, not that there isn't value in one-offs um, where students kind of seek out those opportunities more as electives. Absolutely there's value in that. But from achieving program level outcomes, that kind of idea of where does it happen across a program of study, and then how might we actually look at that through academic program review, for example, and help support that thinking um, and reflection on um, where it kind of is best embedded is, is absolutely the ideal. So it's a great question. Yeah, Carolyn. How would you create an authentic experiential learning opportunity in an online context? Uh -huh. Great, I, great point. So I'm gonna give a specific example because we actually did a lot of this intentionally during the pandemic <laughs> because we recognized that we were missing our contexts. Um, and we actually partnered um, over the last two years with a company called Ripen which may be known to some people. It's a company that actually helps connect faculty with employers who have real authentic issues, problems, projects, and faculty can connect with them um, through Ripen and with the support of career service colleagues to actually take that project process or problem and have students work on it as part of their study. And it's all done virtually. So the students don't have to go into that workplace. They don't have to relocate. They can actually work on that real problem in a virtual context and help collaboratively develop uh, solutions and give those back to the employer. The employer then actually gives feedback to the students on how helpful they were. And so the employer benefits from having students actually consider their problem and um, through guidance, right, by the instructor, help to come up with solutions. So they get kind of a, a myriad of solutions presented to them and the student benefits from having that real context and interaction with a with an employer so that's just one example where we can actually have a virtual experience um, that that still provides that richness of context yeah I think I'm probably out of time Kim's not giving me the <laughs> but um, we are going to take all of these conversations and move them into the workshops now. So I really appreciate your um, engagement, your thinking, your questions, and uh, thank you very much. I'll pass back over to Kim.